Hi, and welcome to another video for Biology 241. This one is specifically for Biology 241 Spring 2022, but it'll probably be used for future Biology 241 classes as well. So I'm your professor, Christina Howard, and what you're looking at right now is my YouTube channel. Um, so I mentioned earlier in the term that I would get two playlists up and going for Biology 241, and that you guys would have your own playlists. So this one here is the lecture videos and orientation videos section, um, and I'll be adding to that. And then this one is the one for lab stuff. So a few of you have been a little bit confused about lecture versus lab. Um, I'm producing separate videos for each of those. There, of course, is conceptual overlap because lecture and lab cover a lot of the same things, but the video playlist will be separate because the nature of the material is different between lecture and lab. Lecture is for physiology, the how things work aspect, and lab is for more anatomy. So what stuff is there? What does it look like? Where is it located? Those kinds of things. So lab stuff will be found here. So there's already a video in this playlist for you. And after I get done with this ad, um, you'll notice that it says biology 160 histology walkthrough. The reason I put this in here as well is because this has a walkthrough of the histology of epithelia and some of the connective tissues and muscle tissues that you'll need to see and know for Biology 241. Um, this particular video that I'm making right now, the one that I'm currently recording, I'm going to add to and build upon what you learned in Histology Guide during this 160 walkthrough for histology to bring us up to speed to the histology level of specificity that we have for Biology 241. So this particular video is going to cover the epithelia and connective tissues and muscle tissue and nervous tissue and such. The next video I make after this will be the one for the integumentary system. So there'll be two videos uploaded today for lab specifically. Okay, so with that, I recommend you watch this video first the 160 histology walkthrough, lots of good stuff in there. And then this video will recapitulate a little bit of that and also add some stuff to it. So with regard to the histology that you have to know for the first lab practical, the first thing that you have to do is learn about epithelium. So epithelium is a kind of tissue that is comprised of sheets of cells that are lining or covering an internal or an external surface. So this is a good way to keep body parts separate. So for example, your alimentary canal, your GI tract, that's gonna keep bad things that you don't wanna absorb inside of your GI tract in the lumen, which is the hollow space in the middle of the organ, but allow transport of nutrients from that lumen into your bloodstream. So all epithelia are the same. There are one or more sheets of cells, and then those are all stuck to a basement membrane, which separates an epithelium from an underlying connective tissue. So if that was like a cuboidal epithelium, for example, you would see a single layer of squarish cells with a nice round central nucleus. And then you'd see a little pinkish line usually. And then below that, there would be collagen fibers and maybe some adipocytes. Let's draw some nuclei of fibroblasts in the nucleus of the adipocyte. So you would have connective tissue underneath, epithelium on top, and the basement membrane. is a shared membrane that's excreted by both the epithelium and the connective tissue below. It's a sticky layer that allows these two layers to adhere to each other. So, just very quickly before we dive in, the epithelium naming scheme, so how you refer to them, um, this is plural by the way, so you have two options for naming, the first naming convention, and that is by number of layers. So there's only two choices here. 
simple, which means one layer. Or stratified, which means more than one layer. So there is a counting system here, and it's either one or lots. There's nothing in between. So after that, you have a choice. The next naming convention is the shape of cells at the apical surface. So the apical surface of an epithelium is the side of it that faces the lumen. And so we have lots of different options here. We've got goofed on that. That's a, an exception. My bad. So we've got squamous, which are thin and flat cells. They look like a cut in half sunny side up egg. Cuboidal, which in cross section look like a square, the nice round central nucleus. And we also have columnar, which are tall and skinny, and they exhibit something called polarity. Polarity means the nucleus is down towards the basement membrane. In the epithelium, so it's not right in the middle, there's some space above it. So that's typical of columnar epithelium, as is this sort of ovally shaped, squished nucleus, compared with the cuboidal epithelial nucleus, which is more round and nice and dead in the center of the cell. So there are some exceptions, and that's the one I started drawing before I realized. Pseudostratified means pretending to be stratified, but isn't really. And transitional epithelium, which is a specialized stretchy epithelium that you only find in the urinary tract, nowhere else. So if I ask you to identify an epithelial tissue on the lab practical, your answer needs to include both how many layers it has and the shape of its cells, unless it's one of the exceptions. So a good example would be stratified, squamous, epithelium. Simple as that. So stratified tells me it's more than one layer, squamous tells me what shape the cells at the apical surface are, and epithelium tells me that it's a lining tissue, not a connective tissue. So this is an explanation of the semantics of epithelium, so how and why they're named what they are. So let's go back to our histology guide. Um, I'm going to skip some of the histology uh, examples that I showed you in the 160 walkthrough because I don't want this to be redundant. Instead, I'm going to focus on alternate views or interpretations of this stuff. So for example, in your slides, um, we've got a lot of simple squamous epithelium slides that are slides of the lungs. So I'm going to show you that. And I want to remind you while I'm doing this that when you're learning this stuff, what you should be doing is finding the cells and tissues that are going to contain the epithelial types or connective tissue types of interest. And in your atlas, it'll show you in the picture descriptions which organs you can expect to find those tissues in. And so in addition to looking at the epithelium section of histology guide, you can also go find the epithelial types in their own specific section. So if you're like, I know that there's lots of squamous epithelium in the lungs, you can then decide to go look in the lung area of histology guide. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'm doing that specifically because this reflects what slides we have in our lab that you're going to be tested on. So I want to be careful to show you those 
um, the slides that resemble your slides. So you'll notice I'm zooming pretty far in here. So the lungs are made up of little bubbles of tissue that are filled with air called alveoli. So like I'm highlighting one of them right here. And then here's another one. Most of what you see when you look at the lung tissue is going to be alveoli. So you can see that they're air spaces lined with very, very thin, skinny tissue. That tissue is stratify or excuse me, simple squamous epithelium. So I'm going to zoom a little bit further in now. Let's do 40x because that's the maximum that you have available to you. Sometimes if you can see this like blurry area in the middle of the slide, sometimes histology guys has a hard time and it likes to buffer, which is what it was doing just now. So each alveolus, which is the singular, is made of simple squamous epithelium. So the cells that are making up the walls of this alveolus making up these little skinny swaths of tissue. These are all simple squamous epithelium. So you can see a thin flattened nucleus and a little bit of cytoplasm on each side. And as you can imagine, one of the functions for simple squamous epithelium is to allow for diffusion. So diffusion goes fastest when the distance that it has to diffuse is very small. So if I'm an oxygen molecule that's been breathed in, because the squamous epithelium is so skinny and there's blood right here, I can just diffuse right on into this blood and get carried away and go back to the heart to get distributed to provide oxygenated blood to my cells and tissues. So one of the functions of simple squamous epithelium is to be skinny in order to facilitate diffusion of various things. So I just gave you the example of oxygen in the lungs. The other example would be carbon dioxide comes out of the blood and gets dumped into the lungs. Again, skinny simple squamous epithelium is going to facilitate that diffusion. Makes it easy for it to happen because the diffusion barrier is so slim. So most of what you see when you look at the lung tissue is simple squamous epithelium. But that's not the only place in the lung that simple epi squamous epithelium is found. Another place that you find simple squamous epithelium is lining blood vessels. In fact, one of you found this in lab today. So this big lumen right here is an artery. Highlighting. And blood vessels, like arteries, are lined with simple squamous epithelium. So let's go find that. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. And we're going to look and see what we would expect to see for simple squamous epithelium, which are thin, flattened nuclei. You can see a little bit of cytoplasm on either side. So here's the nucleus, and then here's its cytoplasm. Like that. Or here's another one. So you can see all these thin, flattened nuclei all the way around the edge of this blood vessel. So these are also simple squamous epithelium. But in this case, it's not standing alone like it does in the lung tissue, um, providing diffusion properties. It's all It has connective tissue underlying it and smooth muscle as well. But we will look at those independently. 
The other thing that it's easy to see in lung tissue like this is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So I'm trying to, I'm just cruising around the slide trying to find the best example that I like the most of that epithelial type. And what you're going to notice is I'm just moving around the slide, scanning for things that I think might be favorable examples of stuff. That is also what you should be doing when you are working on the microscope. Um, one thing I noticed that beginner histologists don't do very well is they pretty much get a focus on one spot and then they don't use these stage adjustment knobs to move around the slide and see what's there. They just stick to their one spot. That's a big mistake. You want to cruise around the slide and see what there is to see. So here we have a bronchiole, which is the name of this tube. That's not important for you right now. I'm just giving you additional context so that you know what you're looking at. So what you're going to see here, and I'm going to circle the nuclei, is we've got tall, skinny cells. And I can tell that they're exhibiting polarity because I can see this distance above the nuclear line for most of the epithelium. But what I'm also seeing is that there are nuclei at multiple different heights in this tissue. Some of them are all the way at the top, like this guy. Some of them are at the bottom. This one looks like it's in the process of dividing. This one's at the top. So we have this nuclear arrangement. It's not a neat, tidy little band. It's multiple nuclei of cells at multiple different heights within the tissue. I'm also seeing this wispy stuff at the top here. These are cilia. So because I can tell it's columnar by the cell polarity, because I see cilia, and because I see nuclei at multiple different heights, that would be enough information for me to conclude that this is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So pseudostratified means pretending to be stratified, but isn't actually stratified. Um, and the reason for that is that even though these nuclei are at different heights, all of the cells to which those nuclei belong are actually anchored to the bottom at the basement membrane. So there's not actually cells stacked on top of each other. It just looks like that because of the nuclei. OK. So let's go find some other things to look at. And for this, we're going to go back up. And I'll just run through the other connect or other epithelial types really quickly. So for simple cuboidal epithelium, there's all kinds of options for this, but I tend to choose the kidney because it's an easy place to find it. There's, it's all over the place. So what you're going to see in the kidney are there's these tubes, and you're getting different sections of all of these tubes. But what you'll notice if you look closely is that we have cells that are roughly square-shaped, And they each have a nice round nucleus that's right in the center. Same deal down here with this guy. So if you look closely, you can see that this is all over the place. So here's cuboidal cells as well, which means that this tube is made out of simple cuboidal epithelium. So is this one. So again, nice square-shaped cells with a round central nucleus. So all of these tubes in the kidney are going to be made out of simple cuboidal epithelium. So if I circle one of these tubes and I say identify the tissue type that makes up this tube, you would say simple cuboidal epithelium. You don't have to recognize that this is the kidney yet. That will come later. For now, I'm just asking you to tell me what the tissue type is. While we're here, I just thought I would take a moment to point out, you can also see simple squamous epithelium in the kidney here. 
So again, we can see thin, flattened nuclei of cells lining this space. Those are all simple squamous cells. So this space here is called the capsular space, and it is lined with simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so zooming back out, in lab, lab today I said that the kidney is mostly a bunch of wadded up tubes of various kinds, and you can see that really easily here. Lots of lumens, the little white spaces. Let's go to a place where the tubes are more cross-sectional. Here's a nice spot. And again, look, nice little square-shaped cells, central nucleus. Again, simple cuboidal epithelium. So the kidney is mostly simple cuboidal epithelium, to be honest. Okay, so simple columnar is the other variety, and let's uh, have a look at that. I also warned you guys today that although you're expecting simple columnar to probably look something like this, where there's a nice orderly row of tall skinny cells and the row is flat with the nuclei like so. In most of the digestive tract, which is what these are, so the ileum, the jejunum, the bile duct, these are all part of the GI tract and the ovary uh, is obviously part of the female reproductive system. But in these structures, the epithelium is not flat like this, it's folded into these finger-like projections called villi, where the columnar epithelium lines the outside of this villus, and then there's a core of connective tissue in the middle. So just, just so you're aware, the foldiness of this epithelial type sometimes throws students off, but if you know what you're looking for, you should be fine. Okay, so here are some of those villi, just like I described, the little finger-like projections. So if I'm a student and I know that those are where I can expect to see simple columnar epithelium, that is a place that I would choose to zoom in. And if I do that, lo and behold, I can see nuclei mostly in a nice orderly band in the middle, and then a distance between them and the top of the cells. So this orderly band of nuclei tells me that this is simple columnar epithelium. Now, I know that you, some of you might be saying, but Professor Howard, what are these little purple things um, aren't they nuclei that are going all the way to the top and then therefore shouldn't it be pseudostratified? This particular stain is called a pass reaction stain, periodic acid shift reaction, and the pass stain stains mucus dark purplish black. So what you're actually seeing, these things are goblet cells that are secreting mucus, they're not the nuclei of cells. Other than that stain difference, this has really good simple columnar morphology though. So let's go look at another example, probably that hasn't been stained with the past reagent because that should help clear that up. You'll also notice that I'm picking multiple views of the same tissue so that I can see all the different variations I might expect of that tissue. That's a good idea for you to do as well in the lab. So don't just study a tissue type off of one slide and then be like, I'm done learning this, because what if I pick a different slide for the test? Then you would be out of luck, wouldn't you? So you want to not do that. So depending on how things are sliced, sometimes things get sliced at an angle. So here you can actually see the surfaces of the cells a little bit, as well as the bottoms of them, and they've been kind of smushed over. But then over here you can see this is a nice, normal, direct cross-section of these cells. So I'm looking for stuff like this. Ooh, excuse me. I'm looking for stuff like this, 
when I'm trying to select questions for a test, I try to pick tissues that are most representative and are not all weird and wonky looking. So for example, I wouldn't pick this area to, to point at to ask you about simple columnar epithelium because I can tell that it's simple even though it doesn't look like that, but I wouldn't expect you to be able to do that yet just because you're not advanced histologists quite yet. So again, here I can even see the outlines of the cells and I can see the nucleus is down towards the basement membrane, so it's exhibiting that polarity that I expected it to exhibit. And there's just one single nice orderly row of nuclei that are sitting down away from the apical surface. So all of these are simple columnar epithelium is what, what tissue these cells make up together. So again, lots of examples is the best way to learn these so that you're prepared for whatever variety of epithelium I show you. So I went over pseudostratified epithelium before, and I believe I also went over it in the 160 walkthrough, so I'm not going to do it again here. But I am going to show you stratified squamous epithelium, and then I'm going to move on to some connective tissues and the other kinds of tissues that you need. So stratified squamous epithelium is more than one layer, so I'm bracketing the entire depth of the stratified squamous epithelium with this yellow bracket. And it's actually pretty easy to see where the margin is between the stratified squamous epithelium and the connective tissue below it. So I'm just going to follow that margin with my yellow pen here. So that's nice and easy. So you can see that there are many layers of cells all the way down. But you can also see that the cells at the basal surface don't look especially squamous. So if I'm wondering about that as a student, I would look at the top cells. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to notice that they seem thin and flat, and I can see them getting thinner and flatter. Because, like, look at the cells down here, and then as you go up, you can see they get wigglier and thinner and flatter. Until by the time you're at the top, they're very thin and flat. See that? So the cells at the apical surface are the ones that are going to determine the shape name of this tissue. And so this would be, therefore... stratified squamous epithelium, and specifically it is non-keratinized. I will show you what the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium looks like in the skin uh, epithelium or skin histology lecture. We're not doing stratified cuboidal, but we are doing transitional. And I like the bladder for this the most because transitional epithelium is a little bit tricky. Let me try and find a spot I like. So you'll see once again, I'm kind of cruising around looking for areas of this slide that I like and that are representative, meaning that they're a classical, very ordinary looking representation. I see some good stuff here, but maybe the, this is gonna be the relaxed piece of ureter. That might be better. Oh yeah, there we go. Oops, sorry, I'm scrolling a little too fast here. There we go. So I chose the relaxed one because transitional epithelium is kind of like a hair scrunchie. So a hair scrunchie, if you're not familiar, is an elastic, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to slam my elbow on the table, is an elastic band with some fabric around it. And when the elastic is relaxed, the fabric scrunches up. But when you stretch the elastic, the fabric straightens out. So in a relaxed ureter or bladder, the apical cells of transitional epithelium are going to be relaxed and sort of bunchy or frilly, just like the hair scrunchie. So you can see that here. 
So at the apical surface here, instead of having thin flat cells like you would see in stratified squamous epithelium, which this is most often mistaken for, you see these domed, um, they're often called umbrella cells, which apparently I can't spell umbrella. Let's try that again. So the domed umbrella cells are a result of the this very stretchy tissue being relaxed at the time it was sliced. I'll show you that in the bladder slide too. I just like to start with this example because these are really nice and obvious. So this is transitional epithelium. So I found the lumen, which is this big white space. You'll notice that it's pointy here. So the pointiness is called a stellate lumen. Stellate, that word, is an adjective that means star-shaped or star-like. I'm never going to ask you if something is a stellate lumen, so don't put that as an answer. I'm just saying that a stellate lumen is a visual indicator that you're in the bladder or the ureter. And if you know that transitional epithelium is only found in the urinary system, that means that if you see a stellate lumen, there's a fairly good chance that you're looking at transitional epithelium. So it's a context clue that you can use to figure out if it is the epithelium you suspected of being. So again, we see a relaxed bladder and these nice domed apical cells, the umbrella cells with the dome-shaped tops. See that? So this again is typical of transitional epithelium. Okay. So now I'm actually going to pivot over to connective tissue. And I really like the connective tissue options on histology guide because it has this really nice little sampler platter here of different connective tissue that shows you all of them. So you can use that. I'm not going to show it to you right now because it's something that you can do on your own. But we're going to start with loose or areolar connective tissue. This is a great example of it, and this looks like a lot like what we have in the lab. So this is going to be one of the types of connective tissue proper. And it's got a lot going on, as you can see. So some of these nuclei, I use yellow here because it's easier to sort of point at them. Some of these are going to be the nuclei of fibroblasts. So a fibroblast is a cell that secretes fibers. So these squiggly pink ones that I'm circling here, and you can see they're kind of all over the place, but they're masked over with other stuff. The pink ones are collagen fibers. These dark black ones that I'm tracing here, are elastic fibers. So we have this hodgepodge of collagen fibers and elastic fibers, and then we have a bunch of different cell types here as well. Um, so I pointed out the nucleus of a fibroblast. I'm also going to go ahead and circle. See, there's this speckly area. These are mast cells, which are a type of immune cell that sit in your connective tissue. And you might also see macrophages hanging out in here. Um, I'm not going to ask you to identify mast cells uh, or fibroblast nuclei. I'm just telling you what's here so that you have an, a way to make sense of the chaos of loose connective tissue. So loose areolar connective tissue has all of these features. 
lots of collagen and elastic fibers, lots of visible nuclei of both the cells that make the fibers and various other kinds of cells. And nothing else really looks like this. So it, this is a nice type of connective tissue to, to learn because it doesn't really have any doppelgangers or lookalikes. It's pretty much the only thing that looks like this. So this is loose areolar connective tissue. OK, so let's move on to the next connective tissue. Um, and I already did dense regular connective tissue in the 160 walkthrough, I believe. I'm just checking here. Bear with me. Yep, there it is. And it looks like I did hyaline cartilage and bone as well. So we'll skip all those. So let's check out dense to irregular connective tissue. You'll notice that I'm tending to hide this sidebar of histology guide. That's just because I don't need it. Um, you are welcome to keep it here if you want, because you're just learning. You're not the expert that I am, but you will someday be. And therefore, this might be useful to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So note that it says dense irregular connective tissue in a hyperlink. So I'm going to click that and show you what it does. So as you can see, it navigates you to a place on the slide that contains dense irregular connective tissue. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So what you'll notice, and I, I hope I'm not making anybody grossed out by this, but it kind of looks like Canadian bacon or pork, where there's lots of multi-directional collagen fibers in little clumps and swaths. And then here and there, you see nuclei of fibroblasts, which are the cells that are producing all of these collagen fibers. So large amounts of irregular arranged collagen fibers plus fibroblast nuclei, but sparse. So you notice that this tissue is not highly cellular, meaning most of what you see when you look at the tissue is not cells. Most of it is non-living collagen fibers. So large amounts of irregularly arranged collagen fibers plus fibroblast nuclei equals dense irregular connective tissue. And dense irregular connective tissue is found all over the place in the body. It's very, very common. So this is by far the last place you'll, this is by far from the last place you'll see this. And the dermis, which is actually what we're looking at now, is one of the things that's a fair game for the integumentary system portion of your lab practical. And the dermis is primarily made of dense irregular connective tissue. So I'll, I'll talk more about that in the skin video, um, but I just wanted to mention it since it's here. OK, I'm strategically navigating past some stratified cuboidal epithelium because it's not on your list. However, if you, if you wanted to know what it looks like, it looks like this. I am going on purpose over to the adipose tissue that I see. And you might be wondering, how did you see that if we were all the way over in that other spot where there wasn't any? I was looking at the inset. So what you'll notice is right here, there's a little inset version of the entire slide and the little blue box shows us where we are. So I noticed the adipose tissue and I navigated to it and I'm using the blue box as my guide. So adipose tissue looks like this. This is a big chunk of it. So it looks like what large swaths of nothing and then it, every now and then you'll see a nucleus. So let me zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it better. So there's one 
There's one. There's a couple. There's one. There's one. So here's why this looks like this. These little areas right here, this is the cell membrane. And then you can see the nucleus shoved off to the edge. So fat cells, which is what adipose cells are, they store triglycerides, which are fats. So remember, triglycerides have this general uh, shape where they have a glycerol molecule with one, two, three fatty acids hanging off of them. So this is a one with a monounsaturated fatty acid, meaning one of the legs is unsaturated. So triglycerides are liquid primarily inside of the fat, and they occupy the adipocyte in the form of a giant lipid droplet. And triglycerides also don't like to pick up stain. So hematoxylin, which is the purple stain, bounces right off. Eosin, which is the pink stain, bounces right off. It does not stick to those stains because hematoxylin and eosin, which make the pink and purple colors in this picture, those are polar, meaning they like to bind to stuff that has a charge on it. Um, since the triglycerides are nonpolar molecules because they're fatty, they don't like to pick up stain. So what that means for you is when you look at a cell and the cell is housing a very large triglyceride droplet that doesn't pick up stain, this is the triglyceride droplet occupying most of the cell. So I'm going to just write TD for tri triglyceride droplet. And it's just so big that it's not picking up stain. It's blocking out the rest of the cell. You can't really see the other components of the cell, except for maybe the nucleus, which has been shoved off to the side. Here's another example, big triglyceride droplet. Here's our little nucleus. So that's why adipose tissue looks the way it does. So if you see tissue that is amongst other tissue, but it looks like big fluffy bubbles of nothing, odds are it's probably adipose tissue. So I already did bone in the other video, but I didn't do the other two kinds of cartilage. So we did hyaline cartilage in the other video. We didn't do elastic cartilage or fibrocartilage. So I'm gonna show you those. So you'll notice, so here's a big piece of elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage looks a lot like hyaline cartilage, what you'll notice. So you can see the many little lacunae, which are the little apartments that the cells that make up cartilage live in. Chondrocytes are the name of those cells. So it still has chondrocytes and Lacunae. This is plural, by the way. So singular would be lacuna. But in addition to the chondrocytes and lacunae that make up the cartilage, as well as the hyaline cartilage make ma matrix, you can see how dark black all this is. And you can even see that there's like some swaths of it that are extra densely colored. That's because in the extracellular matrix of elastic cartilage, there are elastic fibers. And elastic fibers tend to stain super dense. So if we zoom in, we can see that the darkness is coming from the elastic fibers. And there are lots of them, and you can see that they're very fibery, and sometimes they even cover over a lacuna. And that makes it look very similar to hyaline cartilage in that there's a purplish matrix with visible chondrocytes inside of lacunae. So here we can see the nuclei of a chondrocyte and then the lacuna around it. But we have the addition of elastic fibers, so that makes this not hyaline cartilage, but elastic 
cartilage. I don't know why I added that to the end. Let's try that again. So if you see dark elastic fibers and chondrocytes and lacunae, you would say elastic cartilage. If you only see chondrocytes, lacunae, and a very pretty, uniform, lighter colored, glassy matrix, then you would say hyaline cartilage. This is a very pretty slide, so I just want to look at it. How gorgeous is that? Mason's trichrome is one of my favorite stains. It's so beautiful. I would wear a scarf of that. So in this Mason's trichrome stain, instead of staining collagen fibers pink, they stain collagen fibers blue, um, and then elastic fibers are stained pink. So this is a nice view because what you can see is so gorgeous. The collagen and proteoglycans that make up the matrix are blue colored, which you can see at the edges best. And then these red streaks are the elastic fibers that are making up um, the elastic component of the elastic cartilage. Okay, and then fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is cartilage that has, instead of extra elastic fibers, extra collagen fibers. So it really looks like a mixture between dense irregular connective tissue and cartilage. And again, it creates this extremely beautiful pink and purple tie-dyed appearance where you have these large swaths, see all that pink stuff, of bundles of collagen fibers. So let's write collagen fiber bundle. And then we can still see chondrocytes in lacunae, and I'm pointing to two of them, which is why I'm going to make it plural. Actually, let's make it three. And you can also see the purple stuff, the purple fibers, which are the regular proteoglycans of the normal cartilage extracellular matrix. So that purplish stuff that you see around the chondrocytes in their lacunae in hyaline cartilage, that's made of proteoglycans and those tend to pick up the hematoxyl and stain, which is purplish. So this is typical of fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage you can find in your intervertebral discs, so the padding between your vertebrae, and in fact it says that right up there, um, and in the select other places like uh, the meniscus of your knee, that little cup of fibrocartilage that keeps your knee joint stable, and a few other places. Okay, so let's check out nervous tissue. I'm going to erase some of these little dots here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is try and find the best representation that looks like what you have in lab. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of ones on here that are that good. That's because what we have in lab is a smear which is basically where they take um, cortical nervous tissue from the brains or spinal cords of oxen and they take a little scoop of it like with a butter knife and then they just smear it on a slide and stain it. So it literally says smear on your slide labels for that reason. Uh, fortunately, and usually they're stained with crestal violet, which is just a purplish violet color. This happens to be a spinal cord cross section, but the appearance of the tissue in the center looks almost identical to what you will see if you look at the motor neuron auxin smear. So that's why I chose this. So what you're going to see in the nervous tissue are the cell bodies of neurons, which are all those. And these are called different things. So what neuro means neuron. Soma means body, and if you want to make it plural, you say neurosomata. So one of these is a neurosoma, multiple are neurosomata, slash neuron cell bodies. And the reason I'm emphasizing bodies is because neurons have these extensions and projections 
called dendrites and axons, but you can't usually see all of a given neuron's dendrites and axons in a smear. So what you end up seeing are these cell bodies instead, and that's fine. And then the peppery-like nuclei that are all over the place here, I'm not going to try and circle all of them because as you'd see, it would take me 80 years, but these are nuclei of glial cells. Glial cells are like the support cells of neurons. They exist to help and support neurons in doing their job. One of the biggest characteristics of the neurosomata, uh, the neuron cell bodies, is they have this, like, see how if you look closely at their cytoplasm, there's little dark patches? Those are called nissel bodies. So a violet stained neurosomata with like kind of a chunky or clumpy appearance to its uh, cytoplasm, nissel bodies is classical for neuron cell bodies. And then you can see the nucleus is light, but the nucleolus is really dark. So remember the nucleolus is an area inside of the nucleus where ribosome uh, RNA and DNA are assembled. So that's why the nucleolus is really dark in neurons, but this is typical of the appearance of nervous tissue that you have in our lab, at least so far. So you're looking for neuron cell bodies and you're looking for nuclei of glial cells. That should give you enough information to find nervous tissue. So now let's do muscle. And that's where we'll end this video and I'll do skin in the next one. So skeletal muscle, well, actually, let's just do a little overview here. So muscle tissue, its function in general is to contract and that produces movement. So this little unclosed infinity symbol means therefore or thereby. And there's three types of muscle tissue. We've got striated muscle, which is the fancy way of saying stripey. And these are cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. The third kind is smooth muscle, which is not striated. So it's not stripey, it's smooth. So let's take a look at skeletal muscle and then we will look at the other two kinds. Okay, so I'm gonna pick this one. So what you're going to see in skeletal muscle, especially in longitudinal section, are very large, long cells. So for example, this right here, that's one entire cell. So is this right here. So muscle fibers is another way to say muscle cells. And that's because muscle fibers are long, very large, multicellular cell or most multinuclear cells. So each of these cells has more than one nucleus. And you can also see that the direction of the fibers, they're running in parallel with each other. I'm trying to erase this, it's not cooperating. There we go. So you can see this one is parallel to its neighbor. They're all kind of running in the same direction next to each other. They're not really crisscrossing. So they have multiple fibers running in parallel. So now let's zoom in and let's go check out the striations, which are very obvious in this slide. That's why I picked them. So what you're going to see is they look stripey. You can see these little stripes. See those? It almost looks corrugated. And the stripes are running perpendicular 
to the direction of the muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber is going this way, and the stripes are parallel, or excuse me, perpendicular to the direction of the muscle fiber. So the reason for the striations is because each of these muscle cells is full of proteins that are arranged into a repeating pattern called a sarcomere. You'll learn all about sarcomeres this term. And sarcomeres are made up of proteins, specifically actin and myosin, that are arranged in a repeating stripey pattern. Now, proteins are really, really, really tiny, and you can't see them with the naked eye. But it's cool that you can actually see a pattern in protein arrangement with light microscopy alone to make these stripy guys. Isn't that neat? And you can also see uh, here are multiple nuclei. So this muscle fiber, which is a, one cell, has more than one nucleus. So if you see parallel fibers, large, multinucleate cells, and obvious striations, that equals skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is a fun one. It looks really cool. Now let's go look at cardiac muscle. And I'm specifically going to go for the ones that say intercalated discs because intercalated discs is a really easy and good way to figure out the fact that you're looking at not cardiac or not, excuse me, not skeletal muscle, even though it's uh, striated, but cardiac muscle. So let's go find some. They tend to pop out better if you do a different stain, which is why these are purple instead of pink. not loving this so far. I might select another slide for this. I'll let you know in a minute. I'm just scanning for a place on this slide that has good looking obvious intercalated discs and I'm not really having much luck honestly. Yeah, let's try another slide. I don't know why they said they had good intercalated discs on here. I don't think that's true. Okay, so this is a little bit too cross-sectional for my taste. Let's go over to this one. Yeah, okay, that's better. So we're gonna zoom way in. That's better. So you can still see striations, just not super well, but if you look closely, you can still see that there are stripes that are running perpendicular to the direction of muscle fibers. What you can also see is that these fibers are unicellular and they branch, like so. So here's another fiber with its nucleus. And then you can see the little faint striations that are running perpendicular to them. And then intercalated discs, I'll show you a couple different examples of them in the screen. So you'll see that. See how there's a little horizontal bar there? And let's see, here's another one. Let's find some more. Here's one. Here's one. I'll go look for some more in other places as well. But you can see these little bars that are sort of breaking up the muscle fibers. So these are intercalated discs. This is a place where one muscle cell is glued to another. And intercalated discs are made of two kinds of cell junctions, gap junctions plus desmosomes. So there's two options there. 
Basically, you want the cells to be able to communicate, so you put gap junctions there, which allows the cells to trade materials, but you also don't want them to pull apart from each other when contraction is happening, so you put desmosomes there, which are anchoring in function. So cardiac muscle is one of the trickier varieties just because uh, students have a hard time finding intercalated discs, but it's the kind of thing where once you learn what they look like, they kind of jump out at you all over the place. So I'm trying to find a place with lots of them that are quite good. This is one of the rare cases where I actually think the slides we have in the lab are better than the ones we have on Histology Guide, which is surprising. Okay, so here's one, see the little pink bar crossing. Here's another one, here's one, there's one, there's one. So anytime you see an obvious bar that's crossing the entirety of the junction between two muscle fibers, that's gonna be an intercalated disc. So uninuclear branching cells plus intercalated discs equals cardiac muscle. So I'm going to see if I can find any other slides in the cardiac muscle uh, pages that have good intercalated discs. Really not seeing anything that's blowing my hair back here. Okay, those are good. Those are good, I guess. So different color, but same idea. See this little line here, and this one right here, and this one right here, and this one right here, and that. And so they start to jump out at you once you see them. Once you form a search image, these are all intercalated discs. Like, let's experimentally click on the hyperlink and see where it navigates us to. Okay, yeah, these are actually better. I didn't realize that they were better over in this area. So all of these dark lines that are all over the place, these are nice intercalated disks. Now I see why they picked this one for the intercalated disks. They just have to be in the right area of the slide. And you can see the striations better in this area as well. So you can see the faint cross-hatching marks that are going perpendicular to the direction of the fiber. Okay, and finally, let's look at smooth muscle. So this is smooth muscle that is basically been separated out from the intestine. So the walls of your intestines are made out of smooth muscle. And this is actually giving you two views of smooth muscle. So this is cross-sectional view of smooth muscle, and this is the longitudinal view of smooth muscle. So let's have a little zoom in and see what there is to see as far as differences from the other muscle types. So it's hard to see or make out the margins of each cell, but if you could, here's what you'd see. Each cell has one nucleus and each cell is spindle shaped. So I'm kind of drawing the imaginary outlines of these cells. In some cases you can faintly make them out, in other cases not so much. See that? So, also no striations. So you're going to see lots of nuclei because each muscle fiber has a nucleus and you're going to see no striations. And also notice the nuclei kind of look flattened. So they are pinched this way. So the direction of the muscle fibers is longitudinal and you can definitely see that. And you can see that the nuclei are squished between the muscle fibers so that they are 
sort of squished into a flat shape that is running parallel to the direction of the fibers. So one of the hallmarks of smooth muscle, if you zoom out, especially longitudinal smooth muscle, is it kind of looks like the nuclei are little fish in a stream. So you know how fish orient to the direction of stream flow? So if this is a little fish, maybe those are his fins and there's his tail. All of these little fishies are swimming in the same direction. And if you pay attention to the longitudinal smooth muscle, it kind of just looks like fish swimming in a stream. So that's smooth muscle. And you're going to see smooth muscle over and over and over again. So I know it's a little bit tricky to distinguish right now, but as you see more and more examples of it, it will get easier and easier to identify, I promise. So just for the sake of argument, let's go look at some other examples of it. So here I'm in the mesentery. The major location of smooth muscle in the mesentery is going to be in the walls of this big artery here. So let's go look at that. And again, you can see it's a little bit less plump, but you can still see little fishies in a stream that are swimming parallel to the direction of the muscle fibers. So the walls of arteries are made up of primarily smooth muscle and elastic fibers, so this is smooth muscle. Okay, and that has taken us through all of the rest of the tissue types that I didn't cover in the first histology walkthrough from 160. And so the next video, I'm going to show you the integumentary system, including the layers of the epidermis and the dermis, and also all of the dermal structures like hair follicles, sweat glands, and also the various sensory apparatuses, so Meissner's corpuscles, Pacinian corpuscles, and what have you. But right now, I'm going to make sure that I upload this so that you guys have access to it as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.